So welcome again to our roadside chat, our TechStots free webinar series on our um, history and environmental stuff that we do as part of the State Department of Transportation. Today, we're gonna talk about our history. Over 100 years of um, road building and transportation history across the state. My name is Rebecca DeBrasco. I am TxDOT's lead historian and environmental program manager. I'm also joined um, administering this webinar by historic preservation specialist Jennifer Carpenter, as well as four panelists who have all contributed significantly to a great coffee table book called Miles and Miles of Texas. I will introduce them soon to you. Before we get started, I wanted to also just go over today's agenda. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what is TxDOT's Historic Preservation Program and how you can learn more and get involved with us. And then we're going to open it up to our panelists. I have some questions to get us started, and we hope you'll ask your questions too. Um, so make sure to type your questions into the box or the chat box and send to the host. We should be done this afternoon about 3.30 um, or maybe even longer, depending on how long-winded our panelists are. You know, us historians, we love to talk. So, what exactly, who exactly is TxDOT? When most people think about TxDOT, they hear about us when we're out there telling you about how we're going to, one, make our roads even bigger, <laughs> two, put in toll roads, or three, affect your commute. But we do so much more than that. Did you know that TxDOT helps save historic bridges? We've moved over 100 historic bridges off of our roads and moved them to trails, parks, and museums where they can have another life beyond their vehicular service. TxDOT planners, engineers, and environmental scientists thoroughly review if a road project will disrupt the quality of air and water by increasing traffic, create higher noise levels, put endangered plants or animals at risk, or negatively impact communities and their resources, including historic buildings, cemeteries, and archaeology sites. All of this work that we do happens before any construction starts. And it's part of the work that we do every day that goes beyond the road. For instance, the photo you see represents how TxDOT built wildlife crossings to avoid traffic incidences with the endangered ocelot in South Texas. You can learn more about that story on our webpage, www.txdot.gov, searching for keyword beyond the road. While this information may be new to you, our teams of archaeologists, historians, and environmental scientists have been doing this for over 50 years. 2020 marked the 50th year that TxDOT archaeologists have been working in the field to preserve archaeology sites significant to Texas history. In 1970, TxDOT was the first state agency to conduct permitted archaeology excavations in TxDOT in Texas. Before that, most archaeology was done privately by researchers. We've dug up tens of thousands of cubic feet of dirt in this time. TxDOT's work is guided by federal laws like the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act, or what you may hear a lot called NEPA. These laws require TxDOT to, to stop, look, and listen before we start construction. Driving down Texas roads, you can see evidence of our history and heritage in buildings, bridges, and other structures that line them. Consider the last time you drove down a farm to market road. Chances are you passed an old gas station or hotel. You may have even crossed an iconic metal bridge. Construction projects can change permanently the way that we experience those places. Would we see that TxDOT's um, construction projects might have a negative impact? We conduct mitigation or compensation to make up for the way, make up for that impact. 
Through our historic preservation work, we create brochures, short videos, podcasts, posters, and more as part of our edu outreach and education campaign. We want to share the stories that make Texas unique and share the stories about places you care about. And this campaign allows us to bring those stories just like this webinar to you. And that's not all. Part of TxDOT's mission is to include the public in this decision-making process. Collaborating with you allows you to voice your interest and concern related to ongoing transportation projects. If you are interested in learning more about the historic preservation process at TxDOT and getting involved, we have some brand new resources that are available online for you. This is our new training platform that was just unveiled in the fall of last year. It's set up like a virtual open house where you can walk through the place and check out a host of tables that have videos, that have links, that have documents and more on the entire TxDOT historic preservation process. You can make your way through this training at your leisure. Basically, the total time to watch all the videos included on this training is about one and a half hours. If you're not really up for a training session, make sure to visit our historic preservation website. Once again, you would go to text.gov and search for the keyword historic preservation. This will bring you to this page where you can find links to brochures, success stories, and learn more about the current archaeology projects that TxDOT is doing around the state. We hope that we'll be able to see you soon at future projects. And now on to today's programming. Like I said at the beginning, I'm really excited about the panel we have today. TxDOT first began as the State Highway Department in 1917, so we are 105 years old. TxDOT has a long history that reaches into all corners of the state and follows along with the development and growth of the state of Texas. As a state agency, we own and manage a number of historic resources, including some of the buildings that we work in, historic roads, historic bridges, historic roadside parks and rest areas, historical markers, landscapes, and archaeology sites. TxDOT is now the current is now the largest landowner in the state of Texas. We even beat out King Ranch. In 2016, Carol Dawson, Roger Allen Polson, and Jeff Appold, with the support of Ann Cook, published a fantastic book on the history of TxDOT called Miles and Miles of Texas. Now, you may be thinking, oh my gosh, what a snooze, right? I thought so too but I dutifully bought the book as a TxDOT historian. And let me tell you, some of the stories in this book read like fiction. There's intrigue, there's theft, there's felonies, there's politics, <laughs> but there's also stories of innovation, hard work, and the growth of Texas. And accompanying it all are fantastic images and photographs. And to top all of that off, Willie Nelson wrote the foreword to the book. And today, we have the authors and photo editors of the book here to tell you about it, both the stories in the book about TxDOT's history and also about writing the book itself. Along the way, they will talk about resources that you can use to research transportation history in your own community. Like I said, we really want you to ask them questions and type in your questions in the Q&A box to get them answered. I also want to just plug the book. Look for it in your local bookstore or online. It's still available, still out there. It's pretty hefty, but like I said, it is full of these amazing images and it's a really fun read, um, kind of a rollicking ride through Texas history. So to get us started today, I have some questions of my own. All right, Jennifer, you're gonna have to help me. How do I stop sharing? <laughs> oh, like this. Like that? All right. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start off today um, with Roger. 
Roger began working at what was the State Department of Highways and Public Transportation in spring 1989 as a project hire in the Capitol Travel Information Booth located in the lobby of the State Capitol Building. Roger ended up retiring from TxDOT as the Transportation Commission Coordinator. Good afternoon, Roger. Um, I was hoping today you would tell us a little bit more about your background and how you came about to write this book. Uh, how much time do we have? No. <laughs> we have about um, an hour. So. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. I'll keep it as short as possible. Uh, I, I came to work at TxDOT at the age of 40 because I needed a job. And uh, I got one, uh, and uh, I had no intention of staying there for 23 some odd years, but I did. And um, I worked in the public information uh, av uh, arena most of the time. I worked at that tourist bureau uh, for a couple of months and then moved over to the big uh, building across the street, the Greer Building, and uh, started working in the public information office. Um, one of my first assignments, and well, first of all, the first time I ever met Jeff, and, and he was with the department previously, he showed up at our tourist booth in the lobby with a couple of penguins and Ann Richards, if I remember correctly. And so that was our introduction. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. One of my first um, uh, assignments, uh, this was about 1990, uh, they taxed me with uh, organizing the 80th anniversary celebration of the State Department of Highways would have been 97. So they gave me plenty of lead time to get a statewide celebration going. Um, and we had started that process. And then in 1991, the uh, legislature decided it was appropriate to create a new department. They added some functions and called us the Texas Department of Transportation. The powers that be decided it really was no longer the right thing to be looking back that we needed to be looking forward. So the 80th anniversary uh, was scaled back to a more of an internal celebration. And <laughs> I love that cat. And um, uh, I remember thinking at the time, because we'd put a lot of work into this, I'm thinking, well, won't be long before the 100th comes around, we'll do something then. And then of course I went on uh, to work. Um, uh, and had some fascinating jobs. Jeff and I traveled the state uh, photographing and uh, a taking the time to meet people who were doing interesting and amazing things. Uh, I wrote a lot of history articles for the internal newspaper, uh, a lot of news releases about some of the things you were talking about. And I just kept getting more and more impressed and involved with all the different aspects and the people that were doing these things it was is incredible. So I finally wound up uh, after um, several years working uh, for the uh, Transportation Commission. And uh, in that po position, I continued to meet people across the uh, state, actually across the nation and the legislature and all the big wigs and all that stuff. So I did that. In 2011, late 2011, I decided it was time to step aside. And it dawned on me that it was time to do the book. Uh, I realized it's six six years. Uh, we've got time, and uh, so I I decided to make, take that step in January 12. I retired. In fact, when I uh, went to meet the executive director Phil Wilson at the time, because I worked for him, I, I was telling him I was stepping down and retiring. And he looked at me and, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, the hundredth anniversary is coming up. I'm going to write the book about the hundredth anniversary of TxDOT or the highway department. And he he looked at me a little astonished, uh, as if I he didn't think I was going to have an answer. I think I was just going to sit around the house. And anyway, um, that was the beginning. And uh, as things uh, developed, um, I brought Jeff in because he had retired, and I knew he knew a lot about photography, and he knew a lot about stuff that we'd been doing. And Cook had been a collaborator in the library for all of those years, and then. Uh, real quickly along the way, uh, Jeff had introduced me to some people that Laura Bush was working with to start the Texas Book Festival, and they asked me to come in and help uh, present, do the music uh, parts of the festival. So I got involved with the book festival, which I worked there for 20 years, and thank you, Jeff, for that um, that arrangement. And in that time, I met Carol uh, because she was a noted author and was at all the parties, 
and uh, we uh, had a lot of time to talk about stuff. And there was always a, well, I'll make this quicker. Uh, in writing and developing the book, I realized I was going to have to have money. So I started approaching private engineering firms for the most part. No state money directly went into this book. But I got um, a very generous pledge for uh, a nice sum of uh, sponsorship money. And um, it dawned on me that this thing is happening. And I, if I wanted to make this book worthwhile, I was going to have to find somebody who had actually written a book and knew what they were doing. And so at one of those uh, text book festival parties, I approached Carol. We were at a Mexican restaurant over in East Austin. I said, I want to talk to you about something. And uh, she kind of had the same uh, same thought that you did when we first started talking to me. She's going like, oh, yeah, asphalt, snooze. And um, by the time that dinner was finished, we were both going, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and. And so she agreed to, to come on and spent the next four or five years of her life <laughs> immersed in the transportation business. Uh, and it was an education for all of us, I think. So uh, the book came out in late 2016. Uh, we spent the next two years, including the anniversary in 2017, uh, traveling around the state, going to offices, uh, you know, doing media, stuff like that. And uh, then in 2017, after the centennial was celebrated, we all sort of went on our way with an experience which we'll never forget. And so um, that kind of gives you the 25 cent tour of uh, how we all got here. That's great. Thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, um, I did also wanna thank you and Jennifer, I know y'all put a lot of work into putting this together. And I also wanted to thank the folks at Texas A&M Press who, have, who were great partners. Uh, it, was, it was amazing from the beginning to the end. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, it's just um, to get a book, especially with, you know, all these colorful images like that to help tell a story is pretty incredible to see that out of a publishing <laughs> company. So um, before we talk about the pictures, um, which we have a lot to show you too and really get into, I want to talk to Carol a little bit. Um, Carol Dawson is a native Texan. She was born and raised in Corsicana. And she attended high school in Dallas and the University of Texas in Austin. Carol is a prolific writer. She has multiple magazine and newspaper publications to her name, as well as four critically acclaimed novels and the definitive history of Luby's Cafeteria, which is now on my to read list. So Carol, do you want to give us a little bit more about your background and what made you think that you might be a good fit for um, helping Roger uh, write this book? Sure. Um, when Roger first approached me, <clears throat> as he said, we uh, were a little bit margaritaized <laughs> because <laughs> we were at a party at a, a, a really good Mexican restaurant. And truly my first response after he had said, I've read your Luby's book, I saw what you did, which was not just the history of a business, but the history of a business is a paradigm for middle America for 100 years, which is the, the basis of that book. And he said, and I thought you would be a good person to research and write this book. And I was just going, oh, Okay, uh, gravel, asphalt, I don't, don't think so. But Roger said by the end of the dinner, it was literally within the next 30 seconds that the light bulb went over, on over my head because I realized this was an opportunity to tell the history, not just of Textop, but of Texas through the lens of road development because roads create the, and promote civilization like nothing else does. And they are also the things that linger even after civilizations have, have deteriorated and dissolved. Uh, great examples are the, the Great Incan Road uh, along the spine of South America and the Roman Road um, throughout Europe. And I started thinking about what roads meant to Texas and how interesting it would be 
to follow the history of Texas through road development because it would cover the economy, it would cover cultural history, it would cover uh, all kinds of governmental history. And I got very, very excited about the scope of the project. Um, I had uh, written one nonfiction book. I'd written a number of, of journalistic articles and, you know, uh, been published in, in various periodicals. And I also was a creative writing professor um, and, uh, and a professional editor. So this, this just encompassed a whole big basket of, of, uh, interesting aspects. And I especially love history. So that's, that's what prompted me to say yes to Roger's proposal. <laughs> she said, yes, <laughs> I said, yes, I said, you betcha. And then I got to spend the next several years interviewing fascinating, interesting people, making all kinds of discoveries. I did not know beans about transportation or road development. And for that reason, in a in a bizarre way, I was rather uh, uniquely qualified <laughs> to do this job because I had zero agendas. Uh, I had no preconceived notions including the notion of just how hard it was to get across Texas before uh, roads got developed and um, the Texas State Highway Department was established. I mean, incredibly hard to get across Texas. We, so much of what we take for granted now was impossible back then, or almost impossible. Um, so so it was a very, very exciting journey. Uh, I, I, I uh, will talk later if you still want to know about the kind of researches I did, but that's generally how I came to the project. Great. Yeah, we definitely want to hear about some of your sources that we might be able to use to learn more and also more about what you found. So I'm going to circle back, but I wanted to go ahead and just introduce everyone to our panelists. Mm -hmm. And so first I'm going to um, turn to Jeff. Um, Jeff was the director of audiovisual production at TechSpot for 28 years, and he managed the award-winning group responsible for photography in our travel materials, including the Texas Highways Magazine, as well as photography of department activities and the library containing all of the departmental images. Jeff himself was presented the Raymond Stotzer Award by TechSpot in Texas A&M in 1994. Um, so, Jeff, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your background, um, why you came to work for TechSpot, and um, what exactly is a photo editor? Because that's your your title on the front of the book. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I was uh, actually started out doing uh, educational films and stuff, and I. I, uh, a friend of mine was working at, at TechSpot. I was living in Dallas. A friend of mine was working at TechSpot and said, we're going to have an opening here pretty soon. And I'd like to recommend you. So I came down and I, I brought a reel of 16 millimeter film, a uh, slide carousel, uh, a stack of black and white prints and some videotape. And I said, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I can do that. And miraculously enough, they bought it and they hired me. And, uh, wound up about a year later actually running the section, the, the audiovisual branch, they called it at that time. Now, uh, at that time, it seemed like 60, 70% of our work was uh, tourism related. But after a, just a few years, that started, I changed, that flipped over completely and became text dot related stuff, you know, more highway related. Uh, fortunately, there has always been a really talented staff of photographers that worked at that agency. And uh, if you if you see, if you look through the book, you see all these black and whites from the, the uh, I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, largely shot by photographers carrying big old four by five cameras around with them. That's why it, in the book, it's kind of interesting because you look at these pictures and, and you can use a magnifying glass. The detail is amazing of some of the old ones. And it's uh, uh, 
you know, we're just really fortunate. And then we were really fortunate when my boss got, uh, he got approval to hire a full-time photo librarian. And so we hired Ann, who is like, when you, you know, look in the dictionary under librarian, there's a picture of her. And she uh, brought an uh, unbelievable degree of organization to, uh, to the photo library, which was kicked around. At one time, they were going to give it to the Ransom Center. And this is a lot of photographs. Um, so we put them all in one place. And she started, you know, having a lot of people come in just saying they wanted to use photos for different things, teachers especially, or real estate agents, you know, just please come to Texas, things like that. And she organized it into this huge, huge deal. She's got I think she told me the other day, uh, roughly uh, a quarter of a million images on digital now. Because wow. I mean, the, the, the library is much bigger than that, but she has that many digitized, which is an amazing feat, I think. Uh, but yeah, we, uh, I, I'm not really a photo editor as such. I just happened to, to uh, you know, Roger and I kept talking about why isn't anybody preparing for a uh, hundred year something? We really cared about it and it didn't seem like anybody else really did. Later on, they got on a boat. So yeah, we were, we were talking about a, a book, but it had to be like with a photojournalism bent to it. And then one of your questions was, why are there so many pictures in there? Well, we started with, uh, I think I, I started with 18, 1900 photos. Then I narrowed it down to uh, 700 and some. Then Roger cut that in half down to what about 400, Roger? Yeah, I believe that's about right. Yep. And uh, he made the final decision on it. But we had so much to choose from. It was unbelievable. And Ann has it all categorized uh, in an incredible, incredible way. Uh, but, you know, like I said, uh, I, I had to manage this group that was also television producers and stuff like that. In fact, right now, I keep looking at all these pictures thinking, why aren't your eyes in the upper third of the frame? You know, you need to, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's supposed to, it's just something you can't get away from. Just like, just like Roger is too embarrassed to say this, but he was one of the most popular DJs in Austin for many years. And uh, that's why I told you to say that. Beg your pardon? <laughs> I told you to say that. See, listen to that voice. Wouldn't you kill for <laughs> that? Anyway. <laughs> let, let, me, uh, let me just add a little bit to that before we go. Like Anna, if you don't mind. Um, just in terms of uh, the photo, um, the wealth of photos. And Anne is a godsend. And she is unbelievable. Um but we also had the opportunity to mine photos like uh, Carol would come up with something and say, man, did you know this? And, and we would go, oh, oh no. And then we start, we reached out to some museums and some private collectors, uh, various people and got photos in from the Texas Rangers Museum. So we were able to mine photos from a lot of different resources. But without Ann, uh, this would be a very um, unphotogenic book, I'm sure of it. So. We had, you know, we, we had uh, uh, stuff from a lot of different sources. Uh, you know, Roger and I went to, where was it? Up to Temple to the, you know, where all the fun Ferguson stuff is and things like oh, that. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's just amazing. But, uh, you know, all I can say is I, I used to know a guy that says, well, can't you just take a picture with your eyes? And, you know, I'm like, no, because that doesn't work in 50 years unless it's really, but you see this stuff, the black and whites, especially that, I, that Anne has the four by fives and you realize somebody has, has taken it upon themselves to have something that they could show you in the future, you know, and uh, I mean, sometimes don't you wish you had, when you were, if you're our age, which is old, you know, had a camera or something, and you'd taken a lot more pictures of the house you lived in when you were five or six years old. It's easy now, but it wasn't back then. And somebody that has taken the time to do this, 
and Anne, who took the time to organize all of it. It's pretty amazing. I agree. And Jennifer and I, as historians who are trying to always kind of piece together what was there in the past, how things changed over time, we always hope you take those photographs too. <laughs> so let's meet this. Um, let's meet our our librarian, as she likes to call herself that I love. Um, Ann Cook has an undergraduate degree and a master in library and information science from UT Austin. Before she came to Tech Scott, she also worked at the Texas Historical Commission in Houston Tillotson University here in Austin. She's a lover of film and photography, and she's been working her dream job at Tech Scott for the past 32 years. Wow. I hope she never leaves. <laughs> So, Anne, would you like to tell us, tell us a little bit more about yourself, if you want some background in what exactly is this photo library? Is there more than photos in this library or, or what? Well, when I started, same time Roger did, spring of 89, I was 30, not 40, but definitely, you know, it was the place to be. And um, it's the best job I've ever had. When I started, there were probably about 60,000 photographs in the collection, a combination of slides, black and white, and larger color transparencies. But I would keep getting calls from people, and the first call came from the Texas Highways Magazine staff. They had all the outtakes of the staff photography that had been submitted for publication that hadn't been used, could they send them to me? So the next thing I knew, I had all these boxes full of additional slides and transparencies that had not been cataloged yet. And then um, I kind of outgrew the space I was in. We got another phone call from the records manager out at an unair conditioned warehouse. And he said, I have two coffin sized crates full of photographs do you want them? And at that point, they'd given me more space, and I said yes. So that grew the collection additionally. And by the time we moved to their, our current location, we had well over half a million photographs on film in the collection. Not all of these are real accessible because some of them don't have any captioning information with them at all. And that's one thing I can talk address later. But as the job has changed over time. It's been digitization that's making the collection accessible in ways it never was before. Because when I started, I'd have to go look at every piece of film to see if I could find what somebody wanted. Now I can actually put keywords into our database, which unfortunately is not available outside of TechStot but uh, the database is searchable by a lot of different options, and that's made my job a lot easier. And when Jeff said 250,000 images in the database, about 200,000 of those are actually digital originals, so it wasn't quite as comprehensive a scanning project as it might seem. We're still working on scanning images on film, but we hope to double that in the next year or two scanned images, that is. So a lot of um, TxDOT's Austin-based offices are moving to a new location. And so everyone's cleaning out <laughs> and finding stuff. And has that grown your library? Um, I keep getting phone calls from people that are no longer going to have space. And in fact, really cool, about three weeks ago, I got a call from our procurement people. They had three display cases full of miniature equipment. Most of it die cast metal, bulldozers, dump trucks. They ranged in size from about this big to this big. And they're, they're heavy, they're metal, they're painted, they're gorgeous. And I said, of course I'll take them. And one of the nice things is my current supervisor has encouraged me to create an exhibit space in our new location. So I'll be having rotating exhibits. So those 
I, I don't want to think of them as toys because they're actually models, but those will be something that we can exhibit at various times. Um, and the rest of the time, they'll be nicely taken care of, boxed up and protected. That's amazing. It's amazing, you know, to think about the archive that Textile has amassed over the past few years. Um, before we get into some further questions, um, I wanted to see, Carol, if you could give us a little bit of, um, of a history of Textile. You know, one of the cool things about this book, like I said, was all the intrigue and the politics and the stories. And one of the crazy stories in the book <laughs> is about our um, governor's Ferguson, known colloquially as Ma and Pa Ferguson. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? They were there at the founding of the State Highway Department, right? Absolutely. Uh, they weren't just there at the founding. It was uh, Jim Ferguson who signed the act into law that created the Texas Highway Department and who, because he was a complete sociopath and arch crook, I mean, unbelievably ingenious crook, in some of his schemes, uh, they're, they're dazzling and boggling in their uh, evil complexity. Um, one of the first things he did after signing the act into law that created the Texas Highway Department was to figure out the first way to milk it. And uh, the, the uh, Highway Department got established in the first place because the government of the United States really, really wanted some system of roads that would interconnect across the country, mainly for military purposes. There was also a movement called the Good Roads Movement that was sweeping America, and its big banner cry was, get the farmer out of the mud. Well, you know, oddly enough, a lot of Texas farmers would get mired in mud for entire months at a time. And when that happened, they couldn't get their produce to market. They could not get their kids to school. You know, uh, it was a very agrarian state and people were really isolated. So the idea of good roads was, was foremost in a lot of people's minds and it was a major movement. However, this is Texas. And what that meant was that Texans were very unwilling to submit to any kind of federal governance if we could maintain our own thumbs on our own business. And so there was this huge resistance when the federal government came forward and said, we really want this to happen. We need to have roads that, that uh, militaries can cross the country in for our own security and safety. And it's also a great economic boost and boon to communities across the country. Texas said, uh, uh we're not going to you know. Our counties are in charge of our roads. And quite often, you know, a decent road would begin at one side of the county line and end across the county at the other county line. And that would be it, if you were lucky, depending on the county. So it was not until somebody figured out that oh, wait a minute, the federal government is actually offering to match funds with the states, with federal money to create this road system. And it's based on a formula that includes the number of roads, the, the size, geographical size uh, of the area to be covered and the number of the population in the state the Texas <laughs> people in Texas suddenly realized we'll get more money than anybody else in the entire nation. And of course, then everybody said, oh, OK, it's a good idea after all. So the legislature passed the act to create the uh, Texas Highway Department. It was presented to James Ferguson on April 4th, 1917, to sign. Now, at the same time, James Ferguson was being investigated for a host of scads and scads of illicit 
finances, behaviors. I mean, I won't even go into the list now. If you ever want to read a really interesting, comprehensive list of crookdom, read the book because it was so much fun to investigate uh, and research all of these shenanigans and all of the ways in which he uh, duped people to invest and uh, and create graft and grift and everything. But the first thing he did when he signed this into law was to say, okay, we're going to, you know, you guys are structuring this highway department. So uh, one of the things that has to happen is that vehicles in the state have to be registered and they have to, um, you know, chart, we have to charge a fee for registration. Okay, so that's going to bring, you know, when we calculate how many are going to register, it's going to bring in about, oh, what, $1.8 million. I happen to have a bank in Temple that uh, I uh, owe a lot of money to myself. In fact, I owe mo more money. Of course, he didn't confess this to anybody. I owe more money to this bank than the bank has the capital to cover in the form of loans and a secret uh, and series of secret mortgages and a uh, number. I suggest we funnel all of the money from vehicle registration into the Temple State Bank for safekeeping until such time as we create a structure to uh, transfer that money to. Fortunately, one of the highways commissioners that he had appointed pointed out to James Ferguson uh, we actually have a state treasury that does that job. <laughs> so, but that did not prevent the impeachment articles from also containing the accusation that he had first off wanted to transfer money straight from the Texas State Highway Department into his own bank to cover his own uh, expenditures, loans, indebtedness, et cetera. So what happened with James Ferguson um, a very short time after he signed this uh, act into law was that, of course, he was getting impeached. And he was the first and only governor ever to be impeached in the state of Texas. He was the first out of two governors ever to be indicted in the first place by a grand jury. And uh, the second governor was not indicted by a grand jury until 2014. I will name no names. And uh, so when he was clearly going to be kicked out of office, one day before the impeachment went into effect, he resigned. But that did not begin to stop his chicanery because it was just a few years after that that he manipulated getting his wife um, elected governor. And the plunder really began in earnest from there of the State Highway Department. And uh, it's a very interesting history. I won't take up any more time detailing some of those shenanigans, but oh my gosh, it's so much fun to, to read about and find out about. And it's like a Frank Capra movie. You just cannot believe this sociopathic guy got away with so as much as long as he did through propaganda and seduction and bribery and pardon selling because he wound up uh, he and his wife wound up selling more pardons than were originally inmates when she first took office uh, in the Texas state prison system. So, I mean, the list goes on and on anyway. That's great. Thank you. Um, um, so Richard mentioned something about like going up to Belton to do some more research into the Ferguson's. What was that all about? What was up in Belton? Are you asking me or them? Because we did two went. different trips. It sounds like all of y'all went. <laughs> well, we, we went at different times, actually. Uh, I went in order to go up there and read the Ferguson Forum, like reams of the Ferguson Forum. The Ferguson Forum was a originally a four-page newspaper that Jim Ferguson published in order to, uh, quote, give agricultural advice because he was supposedly Farmer Jim. 
his entire family hated him, by the way. I mean, his siblings, everybody except for this one sibling. Anyway, so, so, but because he had, he was not a farmer and he had cheated them out of family land and inheritance. So he goes up, uh, he lives in Belton. He establishes the Ferguson Forum, which is nothing more than a propaganda sheet to voice his hatred of the Democrats, calling them all kinds of horrible names, all his political en enemies. Also, forcing contractors across the state to spend a whole lot of money buying ads in the Ferguson Forum before they would get permission to be awarded bids, oper bid opportunities for the Texas State Highway Department. In, e in order to even be considered in for a, you know, when you put in a bid, you had to buy a big old expensive ad in the Ferguson Forum. And when his wife was elected governor, she uh, actually made it a law that everybody who was state employed had to subscribe to the Ferguson Forum for a dollar a year, which at that time was the cost of a good pair of girls' leather shoes. That was well, just don't really forget to mention the uh, don't forget to mention the invisible track highway. <laughs> oh, I, I yes. Oh, the invisible track highway was was this boondoggle that that Ferguson conceived and it ran from Temple to Belton and it was um, and that that was as far as it got. And it, and it was designed by this failed engineer from Louisiana who got hired by Miriam Ferguson ma after she got elected uh to construct this highway which was you know very much in ferguson territory because that's where they came from the temple belton area and it was these tracks it was it was built up out of brick and in order to get onto it you had to drive your car up into these tracks that were like railroad tracks and you had to keep your car positioned on those tracks very carefully because they were raised tracks all the way from from Temple to Belton or back because if you veered ever so slightly off the tracks you'd fall over onto the road <laughs> and, and cream your vehicle and it was so bad and the engineering of it was so bad and it and the building of it was was such a, a piece of grift, graft, and scam that it was completely uh, erased and uh, paved over just a few years later. But that, that I mean, really, really screwball uh, little, little uh, projects like that built under the aegis of the Texas Highway Department, unfortunately. Wow. Yeah. Rebecca, oh, sorry. Oh. oh, sorry. I was going to um, ask. So it sounds like the early days were pretty crazy. Um, you know, there was a new department, um, new type of governmental, you know, work and, and area. Um, how over time could you sense how things might have changed or maybe gotten more professional or oh. how did we kind of escape some of that, um, the craziness of the Ferguson's and the grift maybe over time? Well, the the Ferguson sway and and uh, their schemes and this battle for the integrity of the Texas Highway Department lasted about fifteen years, because the Fergusons went in and out of power, and as soon as the Highway Department started getting back on its feet and establishing itself as this really wonderful agency for the state, Ma Ferguson would get reelected into the. Uh, you know, uh, governor's office. This happened twice, and she would take over, and and all the machinations would begin again. Now, the very first really strong, powerful, and persistent uh, state engineer. Oh, and you had to be an engineer to become the head of the highway department. That was built into the law. You had to be an actual civil engineer. So you had to know your biscuits. And uh, as soon as uh, the Fergusons would come back into power, they would start screwing around again. In between the Fergusons, uh, governor, a, a governor of Texas appointed Gib Gilchrist, this young, really strong civil engineer originally from Wills Point, Texas, who 
who was quite upright and quite passionate about building good roads. And he got in there and he started creating innovations and he he got a bunch of equipment left over from World War II and, and bought it up for the highway department to use. And, and you know, at, at really bargain rates, I might add, because as one executive director uh, or deputy executive director of TxDOT once said to me, an engineer can do for $1 what most people take 10 to do. I always really liked that because it's it's a, such a summary of the ethics of TxDOT itself. So Gib Gilchrist was in there. And then as soon as Ma Ferguson got elected uh, governor, he just went, you know what? I've got to resign. I can't stay here because there's no way I can move forward with this pack of crooks. And so then she went out of office. And he got re and 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 while he, while she was in office, he went and worked elsewhere. And then as soon as she got out of office, okay, get him back in. So he was great. He was wonderful. And he and his uh, successor, De the the noble, legendary Dewitt Greer, who then remained state engineer for decades, said. We are going to have an absolutely ethical department and we are going to fight tooth and nail. All these people who are trying to subvert and suborn, and, and, and suborn this agency to their own uh, purposes and their own greed. So it there, took about 15 years. There was a, there was so much money involved, of course. That's why everybody wanted to get into the game. And, and it did come a point where the feds uh, stopped funding. Uh, at, yeah. at one point, because there was so much wrongdoing and no control, and I think Gibb was one of the people. Mr. Gilchrist was one of the people who um, was responsible for restoring that because he brought order and accountability, some uh, amazing accountability. And uh, it, it's a result of these times that you know you hear even today. Oh, the highway department is a bunch of crooks and thieves and blackmailing and all that. Well, there there was a time. But um, the serious Gib Gilchrist, DeWitt Greer team, and their uh, high level of scruples and intelligence, what they were also just great engineers, not just administrators, but they really did establish a, um, an agency that could handle that kind of money and the enormity of the job they had ahead of them of building a transportation system in a state so crazy as Texas. And they also created a system of accountability yeah. that was at that time unique uh, uh, for any agency in the United States, which I found very interesting. So, yeah. So that was one of the things I wanted to kind of follow up on, Carol. Both you and Roger um, could answer this question. Um, with what you said, you know, yeah, there were, I, I got all excited about the like graft and scandal in the book, but there was a lot of really cool innovations that came out of the State Highway Department, out of our engineers, out of Texas, you know, where we really lead the way in developing various things. And I was hoping one or both of you could kind of talk about and highlight some of those. Choose one of us. <laughs> uh, Great, Roger, Carol, you've been talking. I'll give you a little break. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, um, I don't know because I have exactly have a list in front of me. But uh, one of the examples I uh, referred to, how <laughs> she got it, is uh, when when the uh, interstate highway system was proposed by Dwight Eisenhower in the 50s, uh, Dwight Greer was still at that time the uh, uh, in head engineer, and he established some very, very uh, landmark uh, guidelines, some principles, some engineering uh, things. And one of the things that you may not notice if you don't travel outside of Texas is the frontage road. Uh, Texas is unique in having frontage roads on almost all of their interstates, and it's a land um, acquisition or a land access issue where uh, you build a big highway, and all of a sudden the people on the highway can't get to their land. So there are various ways of um, trying to allow them to get to the land. Well, DeWitt built the highways with these frontage roads, which gave the landowners access which obviously made landowners a whole lot happier to have a big highway built across their road. Uh, there's also great safety innovations that were uh, brought forward. And there's a couple of examples in the book of 
uh, some of the great safety engineers and and even the way DeWitt would design highways or even Mr. Gilchrist and all those people where there was a, a limit to the amount of, um, you know, um, curves, um, crossings, various things like that. I mean, it was, uh, and being a, such a, a big state, had a lot of power uh, and other states would often uh, take what Texas was doing. But there are a lot of elements to the highway, the highway system, interstate system, that I think we take for granted that were introduced by these guys. And uh, I don't know, there's like, Carol's got a list of all, all kinds of other amazing things, but safety is definitely one of them. Um, the uh, engineers, when they finally got their uh, ability to actually design the roadways they wanted them, it was always safety first. And that's why you have safety rest areas in Texas now, uh, because people would travel and they would have to build some place for some of them to stop and there was no air conditioning. So they had to have trees. And so they had about a picnic table. And um, a lot of those safety rest areas are no longer controlled by the state, but they have morphed into these really fine uh, rest areas that you see along the state that offer free Wi-Fi and vending machines and really nice uh, restroom facilities and uh, historic exhibits and great, beautiful uh, places, on, on especially on the major highways. And so, uh, so much of it was around safety, but it's, uh, it is documented that there were a ton of innovations. I, I even got a call shortly, a little while after the book from a reporter who had been to Texas and you know where you get off a highway and you can do like the U-turn without having to go through the intersection. Well, he, he saw that. He said, what's this all about? And so somebody referred him to me and it turns out that that was an innovation that was made in Texas. It's called, I guess it's the, what's it, the Texas turnaround. Texas turnaround. I think. Yeah. And uh, that was a way of preventing more and more uh, high, high level interactions of, you know, uh, at level crossings at stop lights or stop signs. If you need to turn around, you just get in that little lane and go that way. So it's just that, that and that's a recent, a fairly recent innovation, but tons and tons of things like that, not to mention the accounting and accountability auditing and other sorts of, um, I, I think Carol could probably actually offer actual facts about this, but uh, it's, it's the more you get into it, the more you realize just how smart these guys were. It's amazing. Carol? <laughs> well, um, I just want to give for instance, one example that happened to be getting constructed while I was researching this book, uh, and that was the uh, 7th Street Bridge, the West 7th Street Bridge mm -hmm. in Fort Worth. I had the privilege of watching that bridge come together uh, on the spot as I was researching and writing this book, and it's the world's first, very first, precast network arc, arc bridge. Uh, and what they did was to build the bridge in sections of precast arches with, with an interlacing network off site, but not far from uh, the area, the river in the area where it had to cross. And then they assembled it piece by piece. And it was just an extraordinary thing to watch uh, getting built. That was a complete textile innovation. Um, that design has since been used elsewhere around the world. There's all kinds of technical innovations. One of the things that Roger mentioned, the frontage roads also were part of uh, a scheme uh, or a, a, a vision of Greer's because he said, wherever we build a highway, we have to make sure that we have a big extra um, amount of right of way far more than you'd think we need on either side of the highway, highway, including beyond the frontage roads, because sooner or later with the population growth in Texas, those highways are gonna to have to be widened. And that's happened over and over and over, uh, as we all know um, in the state. Um, <clears throat> and, and another thing I wanna mention about Greer, it, which I found fascinating to learn, is that when Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower said, okay, now we want to actually build an interconnected system of roads across the United States that are just one long highway across the country. In other words, the interstate. 
I want each state to commit to their part of this, and we will once again cover half the funding, and that state will cover the other half, but they all have to interconnect. Uh, he was inspired to that, of course, by his experience in Germany during World War II when he saw the Audubon and how uh, handy it was for the German military. And so um, he had all the executive directors of uh, transportation departments across the United States come meet with him and discuss this plan for the interstate as we know it now. And with all of them, he was saying, okay, we will fund half of it and you guys need to set up bond programs to um, uh, and pass pass uh, bonds to borrow the money to meet your your half with one exception, and that was Texas. And when Greer met with him, and and Eisenhower proposed that Greer said, "Uh, -uh we're, we're pay. We are a pay as you go agency, and we will be paying our part from our own state funds as we go. We will not be taking out bonds. We will not be taking out loans to do this. That is not going to happen in the state of Texas." And and Eisenhower was going, "But that's impossible. How are you ever going to pull this off?" And he said, "We will." We will through the gas tax, which is what we've always used. We will through vehicle registration. Believe me, it will be done. We pay as we go. And by gosh, he did. And that's exactly uh, the way it worked out. And then the first person to actually design the symbol for the entire United States that got adopted as the interstate symbol with with whatever number of, of the highway is is on there was a TxDOT employee, that, that interstate shield that you see designating an interstate highway. Just wanted to throw that in. Uh, I'm glad you I, did, because if you didn't, I was going to say that. Uh, I, know, I know they're amazing. Cool. And you, we can spend the rest of this time talking about Greer because he truly was a remarkable man. And there's a lot of Greer information in here in this book. Um, but the one thing I thought that was really interesting the visionary aspect of it during the world war ii of course all the men were off fighting there wasn't a lot of highway construction going on but fees were still being collected and greer bankrolled that stuff so when the war was over and the interstate highway and even before the interstate highway come along he was ready to go he was rare and he had money in the bank and was able to immediately put those guys coming back from the war to work and building the farm to market system and the ranch to market system and the state highway system and the state interstate system. And that's just incredible foresight and control uh, that just shows you, um, you know, that, uh, who thinks about that stuff? You know, it's uh, pretty remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Roger. One of the things that's come up for me with some of the studying I've done with historic is also after World War II and just the pace of construction of the build out of the farm to market system, um, the interstate system, and the growth of Tex Texas that happened after World War II led us to um, lead the way in bridge building to where we were building over the 20 years after World War II, we were building an average of two bridges a day. Isn't we that more bridges? We have more bridges in the so, state of Texas than any other state. Right. Wow. Right. Yeah. So I mean 33,000. Texas Tex has always been kind of at the forefront of this stuff and leading the way, which I think is really cool. So oh, um, Jennifer, I want to take a break and see if we have any questions. Jennifer, and then I kind of want to get into resources and um primary sources and show off some pictures. So Jennifer. Yeah. You know, from the yeah. audience. Sure. Yeah, we've gotten a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with a couple of history ones. Um, Roger, Jeff, Carol, any of you can jump in. Are any of you aware of a good book about the road history of Texas prior to 1917? <laughs> yes. <The> Lonesome Dove. <laughs> Just as you know, 300 years before or so. <laughs> uh, there's a wonderful book. Uh, on the history of I-35, uh, and I I read that book as, as part of my research, and it, and it 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 
you know, the fact that I-35 originated as a game trail with with Mastodon and 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 game, uh, I say game wildlife, but to the Native Americans living here, it was a it was a hunting trail, and then eventually bison and um, and it evolved to what it is today. Uh, that book is is quite wonderful because it it covers, uh, it, yeah. It's thank you, Anne. It's co it's called Camino del Norte, how a series of watering holes, fords, and dirt trails evolved into Interstate 35 in Texas. It's a wonderful book. So that's just one example, but there are there are a number. Yeah, cool. I'll have to read that one too. Okay, and then another question for our authors. How did you decide which stories and narratives to center? Because I'm sure there were a ton you had to cut out. Um, which ones made the cut, basically? What were the criteria for that? The best ones. The best ones? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, no, fair. There had, to be, there had to be continuity. And as I said, you know, when I first started researching and writing this book, um, I... I had to do a huge amount of research just to see what the shape of the book was going to be because, you know, I was a complete neophyte, which in one sense, as I said, was an advantage because I didn't come in with a particular vision. And so I had to absorb an enormous amount of, of information about transportation, not only in Texas, but all over the world and what it means and how it developed it, et cetera. And, um, so reading uh, a lot and talking to a lot of people meant that I eventually started seeing an actual shape to the book that would keep it from just being a sort of technical recital of, of you know, how an agency developed. Uh, and, and that way I, you know, you could get glimpses of the personalities behind uh, so many of these things and see a consistent story uh, about Texas, number one, because it covers 400 years of Texas, actually. Um, but Texas and then uh, specifically uh, the Texas Highway Department, TxDOT. Yeah, sometimes these, pro not that I've written a book, but sometimes these projects, they just kind of, you you follow what how it comes. It all, as you do the research, you pull out threads and things sometimes neatly fall into place. So for such a large project like the history of the Texas Highway Department, I'm glad that there was a pathway for you to follow and a roadway. Well, it, it, it meant it meant ingesting a whole lot of stuff that never show up, doesn't show up in the book, but was part of that large tapestry that then you, you know, you have to discern the, uh, the pattern. Sure, sure. Okay, um, I know people are eager to see pictures, so I want to pull some of those up. But then I also wanted to ask Anne questions while I do that. Um, we had a question. Quick, Anne, someone had okay. asked to restate the name of that I-35 book, and it's Camino del Norte, how a series of watering holes, boards, and dirt trails evolved into Interstate 35 in Texas. <laughs> this brings loads of long titles. Camino del Norte, that was the big part of that, so. If you, if you think about it, the, the, that whole thing, I can't help but chime in. Um, most all highway crossings over water started with an animal. <laughs> it would just make sense. You figure out, well, the cows, cows go across there, the bison cross there, the mastodons cross there. We might as well cross there too. So it's a, a kind of a, a something that came to my realization over my years dealing with the subject is that Oh, yeah, that does make sense. You know, it's um, just smart. Yeah. Also, the easiest path across the landscape. Exactly. Yeah. It was the one that created the Animals least. Found that. Mm -hmm. They're smart. They uh, are. Okay. So, Anne, a um, question about the digital photo database you mentioned earlier. Um, and someone was curious why it was not made public. Um, they were thinking that it could be something, you know, for all those photos you didn't have much captioning information on, that it could be crowdsourced. Send it out to the public for their assistance. Uh oh, Anne's muted. <laughs> Sorry. At various times, we've had internal projects to help us with photo IDs. And I'm here to tell you, nine times out of 10, they're not correct. 
So it's a great idea when you crowdsource, like with the National Archives and their crowdsourcing for archivists, where you're actually looking at the content and transcribing it. That's great. But if you let people, they'll guess. And at this point, um, I don't have, there's just me and I don't have time to fact check any mm. suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, the goal, of course, is to get the database available. But at this time, we don't have the bandwidth to host it. And um, it's, uh, I hope to be here at least another three more years. And we're working toward that. But as it is, if you are interested in a specific topic, you can always email me. I did put my email address in chat. But if anybody wants to write it down, it's a n n e dot c o o k at t x d o t dot gov. That's g o v. And you can ask me about a specific place or a specific road or even just something that you think it's tourism related that we might have pictures of. Well, that's great. And you answered the second question already. People were curious on how to contact you um, to research, do some research in the library. So it sounds like email is the best bet. Okay, Rebecca, are we ready to share some photographs now? Sure. So um, these pictures were put together by Anne. Um, I think they all appear in the book. Is that good? Um, and I'm not sure out of the four of you, um, if you want to just maybe kind of walk us through them or just tell us if there's anything story or Jennifer, if you just want to kind of flip through and. Um, This is the part of the, the uh, pre rehearsal that we really didn't clearly no, we didn't really figure out. Either, so. so we're freewheeling here now. Uh, I, I would make a comment about this picture. Um, first of all, it's a picture of a highway, you know, but, we, but, but what Jeff was talking about earlier was some of the artistry and some of these photos were taken. I don't know exactly who took this one. It's in the notes, but uh, some of these photos were taken by highway engineers or, you know, uh, uh, workers in the districts or whatever. I know this is East Texas near Huntsville, but uh, it shows you the frontage roads. I, I question whether this is an actual interstate because of these little turnouts here off of the main lanes, but look at that lighting. That's amazing. Uh, it's a beautiful, a beautiful photograph with the lighting shining down on the road. So um, that's my observation. All right, here's another one. Love that. Out with the old and with the new. Okay, this yeah. This is one of the parts of the collection that is fascinating to me. Down in the lower left hand corner, you can see a five digit number. Yep. I have more than, I mean, you could tell this is would be, we could think of it as 63,405. They start in the 30,000s and they go up through the 90,000s and there is zero identifying information for these negatives. Huh. And some of them, you can look at them and figure out, you know, like you'll see a route number or you'll see a particular feature that, you know, is unique to 1 particular place. This 1, I've never been able to pin down the location on. And the numbering jumps all over the place because I um, didn't send it in with this set, but we've got a picture that's in the 80,000s that's of the Rainbow Bridge construction project, which happened in the mid 1930s. So it bounces all over the place, regardless of date. That's a, that's a, a I would say an improvement in the uh, system. That little bitty bridge down there. Oof. All right, this, this, this road looks a little busier than our 1st road. <laughs> That's Fort worth. I th yeah, huh. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah, a pretty, that. another pretty little picture. Uh, there's some, how do they do that? Oh, I guess those cars on the. The for the uh, background there are parked. That's why they're not blurry. That's pretty cool. This picture too shows in my opinion, some of the more. 
interesting things you can see from our photo library. You know, it's not just about um, roads and stuff like this, like Ann said, this is Fort Worth. So maybe you're studying a certain part of Fort Worth that you knew was along like the old US Highway 80 or something. And, and, and talking to Ann and seeing, you know, what can you see in the background that maybe is useful for some other history research that you're doing um, on maybe that factory or something with the stacks or something like that, you know. So we, these pictures also provide, they're like a rich source of, of other clues about the history of a place that you may not think that, oh, TxDOT, Texas library might be able to help fill in some of those pieces. We have some, some beautiful. unusual collections that don't exactly spring to mind. Um, at one point in the 1930s, the divisions, the districts were asked to do a billboard survey and not every district did, but the districts that did, I've got these photos of billboards. Which gives you kind of, I just thought of it because you can see three billboards in this photograph. And then also, for whatever reason, in the late 30s, they took a picture of every single county courthouse in Texas for a photo album. I don't have the negatives, but I've got the prints. With one exception, they put two photos of the Hardin County Courthouse and no <laughs> photo of the uh, another courthouse. So... But for uh -oh. the most part, every courthouse, and uh, that's been shared at a couple of locations, but I don't, they never did it again. So I don't have color of every courthouse in Texas, but I've got this lovely photo album. I say every courthouse, some of them, the trees are so overgrown, you can't see the courthouse, <laughs> but they tried. Uh, also, Texas Trailers is still a company now. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a great marketing device. Mm -hmm. That photo, if, if uh, you know, a business wants to actually represent itself as, mm -hmm. as being so reliable that it is historically entrenched. That's right. <laughs> All right, here. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I love this picture. I do too. Yeah. Sur it's a survey crew. These, these guys were serious, man. I think it's down south, right, Ann? Oh, you're you're muted again, Ann. <laughs> Sorry, um, that's the Kennedy County survey. Yeah. Um, since the entire Kennedy County was, I believe, the King Ranch, right. there was no public land to build the road, and they held out for a good 20 years almost, but this is in the mid-30s, and they finally allowed a survey crew to design and plan a road. I have a 1935 map and you can just see there's a north south dotted line where they were going to put in a US highway. Yeah. I think Sarita was the only community there in that entire county. That's on 281. Get the surveyors out of the mud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 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 ranch said, "Yeah, you guys can go out and survey. Why don't y'all just start right over there?" <laughs> And you can see the rope that's wrapped around the headlights. They um, had another vehicle and they could tow each other. <laughs> and then you can't see them because they're underwater, but they all had those knee high lace up boots. Oh, yeah. For protection snakes. from snakes. That is crazy. That's funny. All right, here's another. <laughs> That was a huge innovation, the department, and it wasn't just at Texas, obviously, but the eliminating grade crossings for the safety of both the automobile and the train. Yeah, yeah this was a big push in um, the 1930s in Texas. Um, we used a lot of you know, Depression era funds to build these grade separations. Um, so you could have, it was a big safety improvement and some of these are still out there, uh, of course, super narrow, but really old, really cool and really historic. So it's something Jennifer and I deal with. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process of replacing one in Fort Worth right now uh, to help address the larger, wider, taller cars that need to go under the railroad. And so, 
Um, because we can't keep that historic bridge, we've got a photographer out there right now making large format photographs of it that'll ultimately go in the Library of Congress and probably some in Anne's collection. Um, <laughs> But in addition to Anne's collection, um, that just reminded me there, the Library of Congress does have a lot of photographs and prints too about Texas transportation history. A lot of it developed by our office, the Environmental Affairs Office, as things, um, as engineering features were removed from the system, were replaced, were upgraded, um, things like that. So that's another resource that you can go to, to, to learn about bridges and roads and, um, just things like that. So, yeah, we, we, I sourced a few photos from the library of Congress for the book and Jeff has a picture in the Smithsonian. Don't you Jeff? Is it still there? I haven't been up there lately. I don't know. I saw it. <laughs> oh, I, I know this guy. I know that <laughs> nobody ever ran. That's into cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's cool. Talking about um, the resources you guys consulted other than collections here at TechStot, um, is there a bibliography in your book that kind of points out those collections that people could dig into if they had similar questions about transportation or where was there so. a good, yeah, good bibliography somewhere? <laughs> there is, there is several pages of bibliography for my part in it. Um, okay. For, for the writing part uh, and the, the boys can answer imagery part uh, image imagery um, bibliography questions, but yeah. Okay. All right. Here's another new 1, a very fancy trust bridge. Oh. This is US highway 90. That's the Pecos river bridge. Which got um, washed out in the 1950s and replaced with. A much higher bridge that runs from the top of the bluff across to the top of the other bluff. This, I believe, was actually there's a nice little photo essay in the book about the evolution of this bridge. Uh, this, I think, was the second or third bridge that was built. Uh, the first one was right at the the uh, uh, riverbed. And I believe this was actually the ceremony opening this bridge. It lasted for a little while, but every once in the every once in a while the Pecos goes crazy, and uh, it's going to take a lot to take out the current bridge, which many people. It's interesting when you drive over the high bridge now on US 90, you don't really even necessarily notice it unless you stop and look from the uh, the park n next to it, just exactly how tremendous that bridge is. And there's a picture of that in the in the book. I don't think we have one here. 1927, I think. Cool. All right. Uh, Are these some uh, of your engineer guys? <laughs> uh, Mr. D. Barry and Mr. Uh, Jeff, uh, not Gilchrist. Dingwall, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Ding. A flow chart, a flow chart, just a simple little flow chart of how a uh, project is uh, brought to, to bear. <laughs> Is this like a little uh, road information rest area tourist thing? Speaking of centennials, these were opened for the Texas Centennial. Um, it was one of the things that the legislator, like legislature tasked the department with was greeting visitors coming into Texas and directing them to centennial events. Not just the big event in Dallas, but buildings that were being done all over the state projects, um, like the San Jacinto monument, um, the Panhandle Plains historical museum, uh, Gonzalez museum. So, um, that's why they started and I guess they were such a success. That they continue to operate them after the centennial. Okay. I believe those are Aggies that were uh, manning those uh, those. Uh, <laughs> Originally, yes, they were cadets. May or may not be at that point. Cool building. All right, ah. Here's another bridge. Well, being a Dallas guy, um, this is pretty famous. The triple uh, overpass or underpass, triple overpass. You'll recognize this as the uh, near the site of the Kennedy assassination, and um, it was another landmark landmark. Um, 
progress in Dallas for their transportation, because I believe it's a railroad that goes over that. Um, yes. And um, it was a big deal. And it, quite a really beautiful work of architecture as well. And still there. Cool. Yeah, recognize the courthouse. Yeah. Oh, right. I'll, I, I've got to talk about this because I love... <laughs> I love the story in the book about the bridge and the background there over on the right, which is the Rainbow Bridge. Now, that was in construction, and this is how people would get across the bayou down there, um, or the uh, Natchez River, I guess, or Nueces, Natchez, Nueces. Um, and uh, this is how they got across before the Rainbow Bridge was constructed. We also have a really beautiful photo essay of the Rainbow Bridge and uh, some really great photos and uh, that would have been fun. All right, this might be our last photo in our little photo feature here. That's right. Highway 170 in Big Bend. Uh, I think you asked me a question at one point, Rebecca, about what was my favorite highway. That's it. The River Road. What road do you like to drive or what's your favorite highway? Well, I wouldn't drive it right now because I think they're doing some pretty massive reconstruction, but uh, FM 170 from uh, basically Terlingua, Studi Butte to Presidio is the river road, and uh, I just can't get enough of it. And uh, those teepees are still there. They're not made out. They're made out of something permanent, but I don't know what the, what they're, maybe concrete. Painted metal, I think. Yeah. Um, there, there are two TP rest areas. This is the one that's really out of the way. And then there's one on Interstate 10, I think, near Sierra Blanca. Oh, yeah. Okay. And we've introduced color. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't resist. <laughs> I love the, the trailer, the pop-up trailer. That's a beautiful drive. Right along the river. Yeah, that's that's a drive I haven't had an opportunity to take myself yet, but I certainly hope to do because the pictures I've seen just you know barely do it justice in the pictures. So, um, but for me, I came from um, South Carolina before I I came back to Texas. I guess I grew up in Louisiana, came to South Carolina, but my whole family's from Austin and South Carolina and in Louisiana. Really, you didn't have brick streets, and there are a lot of brick streets here in Texas and there are portions of really old roads that are that were built over a hundred years ago that still have the brick paving in Texas and it was some of the first projects I did as a historian at TxDOT um, and I just loved them and um, that's uh, portions of the old Bankhead Highway which um, became state highway number one that runs from Arcana El Paso and um, some up in like kind of the north central part of Texas. I mean, the fact that those bricks in still drive on it today, it's just daily part of um, those people's lives. It's just mind blowing to me as a historian. I think it's just such a cool story. So my hometown, Corsicana, uh, the, the streets downtown are brick. Yeah, that's yeah. And, and they're and just day. beautiful. They date from the the later 19th century, that's so that's, crazy. that's how far they go back. <laughs> back when Corsicana was a major oil boom town, it was it was the first oil boom town west of the Mississippi? Yep. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. Um, this might be our last question before we start to wrap things up. Um, how does someone research a particular roadway in Texas? His example is old number nine, comfort to Fredericksburg. Any tips? I love to go to the highway designation files first, and those are on our text.gov site. Um, and it gives you the history of the highway. Um, usually you'd have to use a current number. In other words, if it's if this highway nine, if there's a footprint of a newer road over it, you would probably research it by that number. But that's a good place to start. Okay. Uh, County historical societies are also a good place because they they built a lot of the really early roads. The counties did, and a lot of the specific county historicals and the Texas. I think the Texas archives have some information about some of that stuff as well. They have scans of our first county maps. 
for each county at the Texas State Library and Archive website. And they also have some of our earlier maps. Um, yeah. They're not necessarily accurate, but they show the planned highway system that was developed between 1917 and 1919. Another resource um, is TxDOT. If we built a road as part of the highway department 100 years, at some point in the history of that road, we very likely have um, plans for that road. And um, we could have plan sets that show the changes of that road over time, uh, where new roads were constructed, if it was realigned, if it was removed, bridges built on that. And that plan set accessibility varies, obviously, based on things. But um, your friendly historians at Textile um, can help do that sort of research. And so Jennifer put um, my contact information on on the screen right now and if you want to look like for the example that old highway nine if you have um, a current or not but just the location if you want to send me an email um i can certainly we can certainly do some quick searching on our end and see if we even have plans for that um and those plan sets you know can can tell you a wealth of information sometimes and sometimes can even be a great source of information of what was on the side of the road at the time that the road was built. So um, some of those show property owners, um, they show development, they show locations of buildings. Um, so it's another really interesting resource that TxDOT has. It's once again, not quite open to the public for research, but um, you know, available if you're able to contact us, we can look for that information to you, so. That's another yeah, we've also got another resource, the Texas Historical Commission. They have some historic highway information on their web page, and that's another good place to check. Some of it's online that you can do your own sleuthing. <laughs> All right, I think that's it for our questions. You want to take Thank us home, you. Rebecca? I did. Oh, I wanted to... Um... Thank all of our panelists again for their stories and time today. And I thought I would give you one last chance. Um, is there anything that you want to tell us? Anything about the part of the book or the history of text thought or doing your research that you really wanted to say that we maybe didn't ask or that you really want to drive home to everyone? Um, so I thought I'd give you a chance to do that. So Jeff, is there anything you wanted to add? No, oh, I just... I wanted to uh, mention something Roger and Carol both were talking about was uh, frontage roads. I, I know a lot of people here last month were going, well, how could those people all be stuck on that highway 95 up on the East Coast? Why, why didn't they just no, the frontage road. <laughs> didn't have any frontage roads? And this is, this is, you know, up there, Washington, Baltimore metro area. They didn't have that. That was something that we did specifically, uh, you know, because this you had to here, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but up there, they don't. They didn't have any way to get off of there. That's why they were stuck on there, freezing to death for hours. And uh, we we have we have some things that were done here that really worked well. The Texas turnaround was another thing. Every time you use one of those things, you go, well, that's a that's a text dot thing, you know. Uh, We've, we've come up with so many things uh, over the years and and the just the the tourist information centers themselves i was i was driving back from new mexico a few months ago and it was really interesting because you know you just thought to yourself if i didn't have this gps stuff or the ways or whatever you can really get lost in texas <laughs> and, and and if you that's why all those entrances have those uh, the major entrance to the highway have have uh, information centers because you can go in there and they'll draw it for you right on a map and hand it to you uh, <laughs> because it's a real handy thing to have out in West Texas I can guarantee you anyway I just want to thank you all for having us. I wanted to uh, add one more thing that I didn't get to talk about, uh, but first of all, I want to uh, thank Mike Mitchell for his tip. He'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, I just got a message from him and I apologize for my poor uh, 
uh, techno peasant um, skills and equipment here at my house. Uh, if any of you have had trouble hearing me, um, but uh, there is a section of the book that I really enjoyed uh, writing, and it's a section on how highways have facilitated different kinds of crime through the years. So I just <laughs> I just wanted to uh, mention that because it was a lot of fun to research, and it was it was kind of a a sideways screwball thing to add to the book, but. Uh, as it turns out, highways have made a big difference to the uh, kind of crimes from stagecoach robbings and bandits to human trafficking uh, in the book. Um, and I, I had a lot, a lot. Yes, Bonnie and Clyde, absolutely <laughs> Bonnie and Clyde. And thank you, Anne. And um, you know, a, a number of other uh, of other crimes, including disguising pickups to look like dot vehicles in order to smuggle bales of marijuana, which some of, the, some of the cartels had uh, managed to pull off. So thank you very much for having us. Uh, I would like to thank all of my many sources for this book. I especially want to tip the hat because I know she's tuning in to Karen Threlkeld. Hi, Karen. So <laughs> good to know that you're out there and you were just amazing in helping this book to develop. Big supporter. Um, if you'll indulge me, you mentioned earlier, Rebecca, that uh, Willie Nelson wrote the foreword to our book. And uh, it's not very long. Is it okay if I read it? No, please do. Please do. It's a good one. I always kind of tear up a little bit when I do this, but um, I'll try to get through it. It starts off with the lyrics of his song, Texas. Just listen to my song. And if you want to see, I'm already started. And if you want to sing along, it's about where I belong, Texas. Sometimes far into the night and until like morning light, I pray with all my might to be in Texas. Now I'm a guitar picker from Abbott, Texas. I always have been, I always will be proud of the state where I grew up. Since the 1930s, I've had the opportunity to watch Texas grow with me. Small footpaths that cut through cow pastures or cotton farms slowly turned into gravel roads that turned into highways that eventually turned into interstates. Over the years, my bands and I have driven a million miles playing music from Amarillo to Brownsville, El Paso to Nacogdoches, and from Austin to the rest of the world. These highways have taken me far, but I always come home to Texas. So as you're driving through our beautiful state, wave if you see me, I'm out there on the road again somewhere it's where I want to be, the only place for me where my spirit can be free, Texas. Willie Nelson. Hey, Willie. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's kind of like, I, I'm so glad you did that. That's a great way to end this presentation. So um, I want to just, again, thank all of you for your time today working with me and Jennifer on figuring out this WebEx thing um, <laughs> and taking a walk back um, through memory lane on this book. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to meet all of you and hear your stories. Um, I hope I we I hope you know everyone out there did too. Um, thank you for your idea and your hard hard work on this fabulous book that makes my job a lot easier. So I really appreciate. Um, and I appreciate knowing that the story of transportation doesn't have to be dry and boring and asphalts and engineers and calculations, but it's really the story of the state of Texas and how we grow and what makes us innovative and special. So um, thank you all again so much for your time this afternoon. And um, I look forward to hopefully working with you in the future. Thank you. And thank oh. you for having us. Of course. Thank you guys. All right, well, this is time today. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and sending us questions. Again, um, I hope you visit us online. And if you have any further questions about research or anything like that, my contact information is here on the website, uh, I mean, on the screen, and you can contact me and um, I'll do the best to help you out. So have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.